Last night, moonlight, starry and fine. This morning, the shore of Labrador spread out before us in the sunshine. It calls ever so hard, and I am hungry to tackle it. Leonidas Hubbard, July 7th, 1903. Leonidas Hubbard was a ambitious young journalist at the turn of the century. Uh, he had grown up in Michigan, uh, came east to make his name. He landed a job at Outing Magazine, but he really wanted to have a reputation greater than just a magazine writer. Labrador seemed to beckon to him as the last unknown blank spot on the map of North America. And so he thought, gee, if I can canoe my way up through Labrador and across and meet the Nescopi Indians, who are still said to be hunting caribou with spears, that would make a great story that was a lot bigger than anything that he had done so far. He recruited a, a friend of his named Dylan Wallace, who was then an oldster, 40 years old, recently widowed, loose ends, practicing law in New York, never a day of out, outdoor wilderness experience. To balance this, Hubbard found, by indirection, a half Cree, half white fellow to be a guide. George Elson lived in the southern part of Hudson's Bay, nowhere near Labrador, but at Hubbard's version came down by train to New York City and for the first time met his future. They took a steamer north past the island of Newfoundland and arrived in an inlet where only a few trappers managed to eke out a living. With only a cruelly drawn map to guide them, Leonidas and his party traveled into one of the last unmapped regions of North America. So they went up the wrong river a small little thing called Susan Brook. And that led them to exhausting days of dragging their boats up what was a little more than a rocky stream, hardly good for canoeing. Uh, and Hubbard never did think to sort of wonder, am I off the wrong track? The days consisted of endless portages, dragging the canoe and hundreds of pounds of provisions up steep rivers and through thick, uncut forests. After months of hardship, by the time they finally decided to turn around, winter was setting in. Their provisions were low, and they began a desperate retreat back to civilization. When they turned around, the race for life against starvation became harder and harder. Hubbard was the slightest in build of them and with the least staying power. He had an indomitable will and probably went far longer than uh, could have been expected, but he was the one who really collapsed first and could go no farther. The two had no choice but to leave Hubbard behind, and they began a desperate trek for help to save Hubbard and their own lives. Within days of leaving him, Hubbard made his final journal entry. I am not suffering. The acute pangs of hunger have given way to indifference. I'm sleepy. I think death from starvation is not so bad. But let no one suppose that I expect it. I am prepared. That is all. I think the boys, with the Lord's help, will be able to save me. In the course of that original 1903 trip, uh, Wallace found himself. And on coming back, found that the story that, that Hubbard would never be able to tell, he could write and did. He wrote a book called The Lower the Labrador Wild. It's a bestseller. And everybody liked it, the journalists, the readers, except for one person, Minor Hubbard, Leonidas' widow. She knew that her husband, Laddie, was full of energy, knew the wilds, could not have done, um, made a wrong term himself. This, this outcome had to be somebody's fault, and the fault was Wallace. Telling the story made him a literary figure, and he became a lecturer and a well-known man of the wilds. So his obvious next adventure was to do what Hubbard had failed to do, uh, go back 
find the George River, make it to the Arctic, and be the first white man to cross the north of Labrador. And Mina was discouraged, grieving, and incredibly angry for the man who, who was responsible for her husband's death. Now to try to steal his vision and take his glory was absolutely intolerable. Enlisting the help of George Elson, the man who had guided and tried to save her husband's life, Mina made the unprecedented decision to return to Labrador and attempt to complete the journey that had taken her husband's life. I sat looking out of the window, aching with a sense of my own littleness and impotence. Suddenly something thrilled through my whole being. I could not tell you what it was. I could not in any definite way describe it to you, but it came like a sudden illumination of darkness and it meant go to Labrador. Since I was 16 and went on my first canoe expedition, there really hasn't been a week or a month that has gone by without me dreaming up some route or river to canoe in Canada. In 2012, myself and three others went on what was undoubtedly the most significant expedition I've ever put together. This was a 4,000 kilometer route from the Pacific Ocean in Alaska through Canada's three territories ending on the Hudson Bay. Over the course of 130 days, we pretty much encountered every type of travel you can imagine, from wading out blizzards in Alaska, to breaking through rotting ice on still frozen lakes, to pulling our boats up hundreds of miles of flooded rivers to ascend the northern parts of the Rocky Mountains. We were really aided and assisted by some pretty incredible outdoor gear. When I returned from the expedition, I really wanted to indulge this long-standing curiosity I had to do a trip using traditional materials. Pretty much big, bulky, heavy things that aren't nearly as waterproof as we have today. If I was gonna do a trip using historic equipment, it made sense to retrace a historic expedition. And the trip that naturally came to mind was Mina Hubbard's 1905 expedition through Labrador. I heard about the trip while I was guiding in Alaska. Uh, Pete gave me a call when I was between trips. I was curious about all the gear and really curious what it would look like, feel like, how it would work, how well it would function, how heavy it would be. And I was excited to figure out the answer to all these questions. We set off from the same Hudson Bay Company post where the original parties began their expeditions. Because the equipment we would be using isn't readily available in stores, it was a great opportunity to connect with some craftsmen and women who would make the equipment for us. I guess it gives you a sense of pride, knowing that the stuff you have with you, that you had a hand in building. You know, quite honestly, when I'm out in the woods or something, I'm on a canoe trip, I hope that what I've made isn't the one that uh, I didn't make well enough. All my life, I've been a really avid outdoors person, and uh, I took my first canoe trip when I was seven or eight years old, somewhere in there and I just really got into it. And of course, back in the day, that's the stuff we used. We had big old canvas canoe pack. We were using the old uh, canvas Boy Scout tents, the old A-frames, you know, without the floors, with the doors you tie shut, without the bug screen. I wanted to work with the stuff and I wanted to, you know, be a part of the stuff that I used. It's very nice to have a job where you're doing something tangible, where you can see the results. You know that what you've made is going to suit exactly what you made it for, because that's what you had in mind when you were designing it.
Blacksmithing is a creative outlet for me because it opens so many doors. I look at blacksmithing like it's uh, like a tree of life, basically, and every single branch that comes off that tree is a different avenue or a different way that you can take the art of blacksmithing and make it your own. Not only is it that piece of steel that you start out with, but it's where you're going to take that piece of steel. Besides the artistic aspect, it has a complete utilitarian aspect. It's kind of finding that connection, um, that balance for me between my work and my play. I'm constantly experimenting. I'm also putting all my self and my creative energy and a lot of you know, my own personal energy into that piece. Well, I think there's a connection that you get to to just other people. Like, if something's made by a machine, it's it's likely going to be perfect, and and that's great. But there's something to be said for a person, an actual person, making something that you then will value. Because in the process of making something, you put a bit of yourself into it. Uh, well, we started pedal making um, kind of as a a way to propel the first canoe we made. I've always been someone who needs to make stuff. I grew up painting and drawing and went to art school and that thing. So crafting things and making things has always been part of what I do. So we made some paddles and they were all right. And then the next ones are a little better, next ones are a little better, and it turns out people liked them and wanted to buy them. The Atkinson Travelers is designed to be an all-purpose canoe. We call it guiding canoes in this area, that so they can do rivers and lakes equally well. Uh, the basic design is kind of uh, modeled after the E.M. White canoe, which is a very famous guide canoe from 1880s or so. Last year was uh, the year I had built my 1,000th boat. It wasn't, the, it wasn't 1,000 new boats. It was between the new ones I've built and the ones I've restored, the 1,000th boat that's gone through the shop. So not only did I build that boat that year, but I also built the boat for the Labrador trip basically building them both at the same time. The history of Hubbard knew the story for a long time. Uh, the trip sounded really interesting, and, and so we were kind of excited to, to build that boat. Well, we had about three days of warm-up going across Grand Lake and then up the lower part of the Nescopy, and uh, it was kind of the easier part of the trip. Uh, today we got to the lower end of the Nescopy River. This is where things get challenging, to say the least. Um, we got our first taste of wading knee deep into cold water with cotton pants and rubber boots. Uh, not quite the Gore-Tex and nylon that either of us are used to, but um, it was all right, it was all right. Tomorrow we start some more challenging rapids that will take us all day to make maybe two, three miles on. Um, and look at Forte. Today was a day. We uh, woke up in the rain, broke camp in the rain, pulled the canoe upriver all day in the rain, and uh, got to camp, set up camp in the rain, 
and here we are in the rain. But we have tent set up, a nice drizzle on the canopy, We've got the wood stove cranked, and we are dry right now with some warm layers. We are feeling really good. Really good. I really hope to God I never make the decision in my life to pull a canoe upstream again. But, the folly of youth. Pulling the boat upriver was so hard that we were both pretty excited to start the portaging section of our journey. To my knowledge, no canoe party had portaged through the WAP stand since Mina Hubbard's crew did over 100 years ago. We really wanted to retrace Mina Hubbard's route as it was, and that meant portaging through 14 miles of thick forest, no trails, just our compasses and this river to guide us. Traveling through the Wapasan is some of the most difficult wilderness travel that I've ever experienced. It was really dense, really thick bushwhacking. Either long, hot, sweaty days or cold, long, rainy days. Um, and trying to find some laughter and keep your sense of humor in the midst of all of that. From the day they started, this was a happy voyage. This was her trip. She was the leader sort of. Obviously had an absolute dependence on the men she was with, and they had an absolute dependence on George Elson. And his knowledge of the, of the land, his ability to deal with, with any circumstance, except for maybe one, falling in love. They both wrote diaries. These diaries can be found, mostly. There are pages of George's diary that have been torn out. Um, by Mina, clearly. Started off as friendly banter and then clearly became affectionate with no positive indication of anything more serious except for what's not there. George usually does the teasing, but now it was my turn. After dinner, George and I went a little ways up while the others put up camp. It is a constant surprise to me that the trip is proving wholly beautiful. I have none of the feelings of loneliness. I do not feel far from home. Mina's crew knew that when George and Mina went off together, let them go, that they needed their time together. Unlike Mina's expedition, which falls into place perfectly, when Dylan Wallace sets out, they make a number of wrong decisions and, and unfortunate decisions, and it's like the Hubbard expedition is repeating itself. The crew exhausted themselves. They exhausted their timetable to the point at which, when they finally got to Lake Michikamau, the first big marker, he offered um, his men the chance to turn back. Clifford Easton, young um, college student, was gung-ho, was going to stick with them all the way, and did, so the two men and one canoe went from there, over the divide, down the George River, to their destination. I landed on my ankle wrong, portaging the canoe yesterday. I could still walk on it. It's not getting any better. And we decided with the pace of travel, having to triple carry everything um, and how dense the forest is. We probably would not reach Michikamau until uh, at least day 40. So we weighed all these factors and made the decision to turn back. Right when we decided to turn back, feeling of relief really kind of washed over me. It was uh, hard going and a lot of hard days ahead of us. And so knowing that we could choose not to do that was, uh, you know, there was a feeling of relief. 
but it was mixed with also feelings of regret of not being able to see so much of the journey that I had looked forward to, that we had looked forward to. And those feelings of regret uh, really grew stronger and stronger in the following days and then the following months. Wallace and Mina, each in their own way, made it to Angaba. Mina was there six weeks earlier. And in the course of that, um, had to wait for the steamer, the annual steamer to come through. In the course of that, Mina paid a visit to George's tent. And in that tent, asked, required George to make a statement that he had always honored as an honorable man. So once again, we can't know quite what happened or didn't happen, but it became clear to George in that tent, northern tip of Labrador, that this was a relationship that couldn't go on. The trip was their life, and now that trip was over. The standard story if you're writing a script is that you have, you know, someone goes up against hardship faces hardship and overcomes it, these wilderness stories. This is, in a way, a story that revolves around failure. Hubbard, quite frankly, is not up to the task of crossing Labrador. In the midst of failure, Hubbard inspires three people, the two men who survived and his wife, who was devoted to him, to go out and try to do this again in his name, but paradoxically as rivals. That to me is a, a fascinating story that in some ways is more interesting than one of, you know, enduring against the elements and, and, and coming up successful. There are definitely times I get that little nagging sense in the back of my head saying, you could have pushed it a little harder, you could have ignored all the pain in your foot, and you could have just got into the Arctic, maybe 20 pounds lighter, but alive. We were reaching the point of no return, and if we kept pushing on, in all likelihood, we probably would have ran out of food and had to get flown out, a situation that would be only slightly better than what happened to Leonidas when he starved to death. Personally, in my life, the Labrador trip happened to mark kind of a transition into a new phase in my own life, leaving a little bit of, uh, leaving the professional outdoor world behind and going back to school, getting married, all these uh, other great things that have come in my life. But to have that like, that demarcating line, that Labrador trip that really separates those two lives that I've led, have that, having that trip be unfinished really feels like that chapter of my life is still slightly unfinished. There's so much more to see in Labrador. There is so much more to do. And I've seen it, and I've felt it now, and I know what to expect. And I really would love to have the opportunity to go back and uh, steal myself up for another trip. Travel west, travel north, travel east for this one, which is new. So go north and go into wild land. Get in deep. Spend some time with yourself. Enjoy something beautiful. Try to take a little bit of that home with you. Every now and then, you're getting the evening like this. It's perfect. <laughs>